Dr. Martin Wanandea was born in Uganda, but became a Londoner at the age of 13. His career choice came from his charismatic godfather, a successful dentist in East Africa. Martin is inspired by the combination of the restorative and surgical challenges that are unique to each patient, but also by the rapid technological development within dentistry. I enjoy working with the digital implant workflow because I love technology. I love technology that has an impact on what we can deliver for patients. And if technology is able to give us better patient outcomes, then it's something I'm interested in. Martin is teaching implant dentistry at the Royal College of Surgeons, England, as well as giving lectures around the world. But normally, you will find him with his team at his London practice, 10 Dental and Facial, a recipient of multiple awards. He enjoys photography, listening to music, visiting art galleries, and collecting gadgets. The next thing he wants to buy is another drone, which would tick both the gadget and the photography list. Please give a warm welcome to Martin Wanandea. Um, I'm now going to spend 10 minutes uh, showing you what I think the future is going to be. And really what we're going to do is look at the future of the digital workflow. I've got to start off by qualifying this slightly. This gentleman, Doug Engel Engelbert, was instrumental in the graphical user interface, what you call your Windows or your Mac operating system, and also the mouse. And he thought the digital revolution was going to surpass anything that's happened in the past with writing or printing. Kurt Gerswar thinks that actually we're getting better quicker, but we don't realize how much better quicker we're getting. The other thing is everything, as we know, from the device in your pocket is getting smaller, faster, and cheaper. How is this going to affect implant practice? I'm going to pick this example here. If you look at this, these are iPhones from 2008 to 2019. And if we look at what happens during this, and we look at the increase in how much the storage jumps each time a new iPhone comes out. What we realize is the time intervals vary, but we go through jumps in terms of how much storage we get on our phone. We reach the point where, if you look at the beginning, it took us one year to gain eight gigabytes. If you look now, it takes us two years to gain 128 gigabytes. And if we carry on with this correlation and we remove the iPhone and we start to look at what is our gain per year in terms of storage on the device some of us have in our pocket. If we plot this along a graph and we start to look at it along this graph, what we realize is the graph starts to look like this. So the future is getting quicker and we are getting faster quicker. And this is summarized by Ray Kurzweil, who talks about the law of accelerating returns, which means that when I'm sat here on this stage, if we look at what I've seen in the past in the future of implantology, we're here. If we look at this arrow, this is me here. And when I look forward, I can only see straight. This is called the intuitive and linear view vision of the future. This is how far I can see. But what we know is historically, we've actually developed like this. This is an exponential view. This is proved historically. And this is proved by the iPhone graph that you also. So your phone gets better a bit at a time, as far as you're concerned. You buy a new one every 18 months. What you don't realize is there is an exponential pattern of growth, which it means the better we get at being better, the faster we get at being better. It's important because when I'm looking today and talking to you, I can only see straight. I only have this perspective. I don't have the perspective that takes me to look further than I can imagine. So having qualified what I'm going to say to you, I'm going to start the talk now. I'm going to look at six different technologies. I'm going to look in a lot more detail at the ones that are more computer-based, a little bit more at the ones that I call the physical ones. We're going to look to see how the future might look for you. We're going to start off with something that was used a lot more and I think was talked about a lot more, which is stem cells. And we all know how stem cells work. But I think they're going to have a new lease of life when they're combined with 3D printing, especially when we're able to 3D print things like tissues. This is elastic bone that can be printed. This can be then impregnated with stem cells. We can also 3D print tissue 
and again, impregnate this with stem cells. So imagine what this means for your massive augmentations on patients. We can also 3D print ceramic, that's coming along and there's companies that are doing this now. And there's also again 3D printing dentures and again this market has been one that many people have been chasing. And recently we've seen the advances with carbon and dense glycerona with this Lucitone denture system. So this is going to happen a lot more. And what we can't imagine is how this is going to affect the market in the long term. If we also then go back and we look at one other physical technology that I'll call it, which is nanotechnology. We know that we can make cameras that are small enough, you know, smaller than, so small that we can see things that we couldn't before. And if we look at what we can do with nanotechnology on implant surfaces, what you see here is the surface of an implant. Where you see the black channel, that is something that is designed to give out whatever you want into your implant. That could be anti-inflammatories, that could be you know, antibiotics. So your implant can go into the patient with the necessary medication to improve healing. And that, I think, is going to be a massive step forward in terms of what's possible. If we step away from that and we look at where we think, again, something that we're seeing more and more in the market, augmented reality. If we look at augmented reality and if we look at it in the context of how we've learned about anatomy, we realize that in the past we guessed by looking at animals, cutting them apart, and deciding if the animal that we'd cut apart was actually related to a human. And only in 1472 did we actually start looking at humans. And from then, this has accelerated to the point where we are now looking at radiographs, which is unique. Before you had a specimen, now you have the actual person in a radiograph. Then the next part we have is when we've got the person in 3D. The next bit of that is actually when we're able to then start to put all of these bits together so that we have some sort of augmented reality system. The problems with this are, you can get these headsets such as you can see, is the actual the sensors are very big, as you can see, and this person doing spinal surgery has got to have a sensor on his mallet and he's got to have a sensor on the spine as well as he does this. So there are some advantages to it, but I think the technology still has a way to go. And it may be in the future this is something that we employ a little bit more. So having looked at augmented reality, we're going to look at blockchain. We all know about blockchain because of Bitcoin and things like Ethereum, but there's some very, very interesting medical uses for this. If we look at companies such as this medical chain, what they are able to do is put the patient in control of their data. So the patient carries a code on their phone. They come to your office or practice, they have some treatment, and then afterwards, that you upload that data onto their code and onto their phone. When they turn up to see another practitioner, they automatically have all the data from all of their dental records from a very long time, going as far back as they've started to, do the, uh, started to use this technology. We can all think of a use for this. We've all been there at one point. Patient walks in with unidentified implant. You then start asking around, you go onto a website that you can see called What Implant Is That? Imagine all the patient had to do was let you scan their phone, and from scanning their phone, what you're able to do is determine what implant, what talk, what abutment, where it was put in, were there biomaterials. This would give, first of all, a huge amount of, of information to you as the practitioner, but also imagine the research that would be possible if every implant was documented in this way. And anonymously, people like Linden had access to all of this research anonymously. Imagine how far we could go with information like that. So we've talked about blockchain. We've talked about all of the other things. And we're now going to focus on where I think we're going to see the big differences in the short term in the future, which is artificial intelligence. If we look at artificial intelligence, what we need to be aware of is it falls into three categories. You've got your artificial narrow intelligence. This is like your supercomputer who's able to beat the chess champion or the Go champion. It's very good, but it's very good at doing one thing, only that one thing. It can beat everybody at that one thing, but actually it can't take you on your phone from here to the meal that we're having later. If we then look at the next part, which is machine learning now, this is also known as, known as artificial general intelligence. What this allows you to do, or what these machines are able to do, is they're able to be as good as the best human across a wide range of different things. And this actually then gets superseded. Where you reach the point where it gets slightly scary, which is deep learning, 
And at deep learning, this computer is thousands of times more powerful and more intelligent than any human being. So there's three different types of artificial intelligence, and we can use them in dentistry for all of these things that you see, but most of the time we're using the first set. Once we get to the point where we use the next part, part of it, the next stage of artificial intelligence, it will be interesting. If we look at diagnosis as an example, there's many, many companies out there that are now offering these services where you can upload your head CT scan, and from your head CT scan, you can then it will then find areas where there's a difference. It will highlight these for you. It will suggest a diagnosis for that area. So a radiologist does not have to look slice by slice through the CT scan. It will do that for you. There's also another company. Which we're going to... I'm going to skip that, sorry. And that allows segmentation. You to look at segmentation and to pull, uh, pull data from different areas so that what it's able to do is to look at your CT scan, merge your STL with your CT scan, segment the roots out, and from there effectively give you the plan. We also know that this is currently being used by lots of planning services. A common one that you'll know about will be aligner services, which are generally planned using artificial intelligence of some sort. But we're going to see this much more because if you think about the solutions that Marlene has talked about, that Lyndon has talked about, those can be presented to you via artificial intelligence because there is a pattern to how you work and it will know your pattern after a while and be able to say, well, Marlene likes her implant like this, Martin likes his implant like that, and predict how you want your implant placed based on your past preferences because it will learn every time you do this. If we think about record keeping, if you think about the amount of time you spend sat there writing your notes at the end of the day, and actually what we've got now is companies that are able to look at your notes, look at your records, and give you a set of options, and then over a period of time start to learn the pattern with which you're able to write your records. And with this, start to suggest records to you. Look at other people's records and then put their best suggestions in front of you. It's now at the point where this can now listen to your conversations, and by listening to your conversations, it will write your notes. If we look at education again, how is artificial intelligence going to work in education? We know that actually there's a massive opportunity. There's a massive opportunity because AI can make your teacher teach you better by telling them what they're teaching badly. We also know that AI can figure out what your students need to know by looking at how they fail and which parts of the curriculum they don't understand, then actually tailor the teaching towards them. AI is also going to allow access by many more people in many more spheres to education. And final thing, this is something I found as well, which looks at, can you imagine the number of times you have a patient that cancels late and you sit there and you think, well, how can I find a patient to fill this slot? This program will look through your schedule. When you have a cancellation, look for the appropriate booking to fill that with. Email and SMS the patient in order to book them into your schedule in order to keep you busy. And things like this, we could, I mean, that's a really, really good use of AI, which is something that a person can do that they have to be reminded of can be now automated so it happens without them having to think. But the question is, how is this going to impact patients and how is this going to impact your practice, all this technology I've shown you? I would say that actually, if you look at it from the patient point of view, what this is going to do is it's going to make, allow patients to have better diagnosis from you as dentists because you'll have AI help you pick out problems within your diagnostic capability. You're going to have better, faster and more predictable treatment because you're not going to have to spend as much time planning and it's going to be quicker to get the results that you need. There's going to be new methods by which you're able to regenerate tissue. There's going to be more control from the patient's perspective of their records and their data. They won't need to remember what they had done when. They just need to turn up with the relevant code at the right time. There's also more time with the dentist as a dentist spends less time doing admin work, they can spend more time with their patients. And finally, really, hopefully, we end up with better trained dentists as a result of this. So really, I'm just going to end with this picture here. This is the Marquez de Plombao. 
If you walk around Lisbon, in right in the middle of the city, he has a statue there. And in 1755, when there was an earthquake, he rebuilt the city. He's credited with this. He was able to see 250 years ago that Lisbon needed to be different. He was able to see so far into the future that you can now see the avenues, the roads, the trees. We now have a wide enough road because 250 years ago, when there was horses and cars, he predicted this modern city would exist. All that you need to do with the technology you see in front of you is not to be that visionary because I think that's exceptional. It's just realize that the opportunities you have to get better in front of you right now and adopt technology are actually your way of linking to the future that's there. I'd like to also end this talk and thank you very much for your kind attention on a sunny Thursday evening. Thank you. <laughs> so, Lyndon, we have time for a short question from you. Or I think I do have lots of questions after I that. I guess you have. Aside from the fact that the future has just solved all the problems we now have today, and I'm really trying to get my brain around that mm. thought, um, what do you think is going to happen in your practice in the next five years? What, which one of these technologies is going to impact your practice? I think the record keeping is going to be very close. I think the AI. I think we're no longer going to have to spend time linking STLs and CT files. I think that's going to be automatic. I can imagine an automatic planning service for your implants. It so exists. I think, it, <laughs> but with, with the crown and abutment yeah. and with your personal preferences after you've programmed it two or three times, I think that those are things that I can see immediately. The tissue engineering and things, those are a little way off because those need some work still to reach the point where they're useful. Yeah. And what about you, Marlena? Which one of these technologies is going to impact your practice of oral surgery in Copenhagen? You know, I think if I could have one wish, it would be for me personally that artificial intelligence will write my journals for me. That will help me great tremendously. <laughs> uh, so that would be my first wish. And then I think it is the matter of uh, implementing all this new technology into our practice and making sure that it's just not only the single cases that we help with the fully guided surgery, but in my practice to, to go a little bit uh, broader with that. So just opening up and getting the new technology into our practice. Sure. I have a comment, not a question, and that is one thing that wasn't mentioned is the impact of this, all these technologies on autonomy. You know, we sit in our individual practices today, and we decide what is quality, right? No one else looks over our shoulder. But when all this data starts showing up in large data sets, and someone can look at them and say, you know, 4% of your implants failed, Martin, but only 1% of Marlena's <laughs> implants failed, and that information is available, that's going to be interesting. And then people are going to be looking at outcomes from large populations, and maybe they're going to decide because the data says so that reimbursement for this therapy or the other therapy is no longer warranted based on the outcomes. Or that if your crown fails at three years, your substandard dentist, your crown should last for 20 years. And that autonomy it, that we have today is likely going to disappear because data, you want to talk about evidence-based dentistry. What we have today in evidence-based dentistry is, is really nonsense. Evidence-based dentistry is going to be the data telling us what the outcomes are. So I think unless you talk about the impact of all the data in digital technology, you're selling it far short. It's going to be remarkably, remarkably powerful. Yeah. Uh, again, in a 10-minute talk, there's still a lot uh, to come, and I know you love data, you Linda. You covered a great deal of yeah, stuff. I know, I, know you, I know you love data, Linda, yeah. as well. I'm afraid of it, too. Yeah.